<clears throat> if you will, please turn to Hebrews chapter 5 if you're not there already. And I just want to remind you what this book is about. And the theme of the book of Hebrews is that Jesus Christ is better than all. Jesus Christ is better than all. We have made our way through four chapters and we are now in the fifth chapter of Hebrews. We learned in Hebrews chapter 1 that Jesus Christ is better than angels, didn't we? We also learned that Jesus Christ is better than the Old Testament prophets. We learned in chapter 3 and through chapter 4 that the Lord Jesus Christ is better than Moses. And toward the latter part of chapter 4 and now into chapter 5, if you're, you've been tracking with us and you're taking notes, we are learning now that Jesus is better than the Aaronic priesthood, is he not? Jesus is better than Le the Levitical priesthood. In fact, uh, according to our title, if you look at the title, if you open your bulletin, the top left, you can see there, the title is the one high priest who perfects it all. The one high priest who perfects it all. That high priest is not Aaron. That high priest is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus perfects it all in at least two ways. If you want to jot this, number one, Christ is our perfection. And through his atonement, uh, he perfected us by his sufferings and by the shedding of his blood. In fact, if I can get Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14 up, it would underscore that. Know this, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, your standing before almighty God is one of perfection. It's one of absolute pristine perfection and not because of anything that you did, but all because of what Christ accomplished for you in both his active and passive obedience. He perfected you by how many offerings? Right, that means Jesus doesn't have to suffer over and over again, right? So when we take the Lord's table at the beginning of every month, when you take that wafer and you drink that wine, that wafer is not literally sort of transubstantiating into Christ's body, whereby he has to suffer over and over again. It was a once for all offering for sin when he said it is finished and his suffering occurred, the shedding of his blood Full remission for all of our sins was accomplished for all of those that put their trust in Christ. Is that good? Yeah. Look at the verse here. It says, by how many offerings? <clears throat> this is important today because the, the, the church today is being confronted with what we call neo-Catholicism. Neo-Catholicism, there is this subtle movement. That's one of the reasons, by the way, why we decided to go into the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> Because Paul is dealing with Jewish Christians that were converted from Judaism over into Christianity. And many of them were tempted to go back to legal works religion as if faith in Jesus was not enough. You and I have the battle today. There are different movements, different groups that would tell you or assert to you, you know, faith in Jesus is cool, but it's not enough. You still have to do something. You're, if you want to go to heaven, you really want to be right with God. You need to go to church on Saturday. Right? If you really want to be holy, you need to stop eating pork. I'd be in big trouble with that one. <laughs> I want pepperoni all over my pizza. I like a, a pork chop. Right? I, I, I love pork. And I love my freedom that I have in Jesus Christ. Jesus made it clear it's not that which goes into a man that defiles him, but that which what? Comes out of the heart. We have freedom in Jesus Christ. But there are other groups that would assert that in order for you to really be holy, for you to really be justified, you need something over, above, and beyond what Christ accomplished at the cross. That's the temptation that you will fight all the rest of your days as to whether or not Christ is enough. Christ is enough for his people. Christ is enough in the eyesight of God. If you are in Christ, you are the very righteousness of God. Where? Where? In him, in him. And you don't need anything more than Christ. That's so important that you know that. So important. So <clears throat> Christ is the perfection. So the title says that he's the one that perfects it all. So he perfects us. But that perfection also, listen, also refers to Christ fulfilling all the Old Testament types and shadows and figures that pointed to the one that would come and complete it all. That means the Old Testament priestly sacerdotal system really was an ABC tutorial system that was never the reality in itself. It was designed to point and teach and instruct men and women that their perfection would never come through that system. It would come only through faith in a perfect person who would come and fulfill all those types. Does that make sense? That's part of the reason why we call Jesus the truth. 
He's the fulfillment of all those Old Testament shadows and, and types. And he's also the truth because he's the, the, the full unveiling and revelation of the invisible God. That's what it means for Christ to be the truth, okay? That's very important that we get that. Now, in Hebrews, remember, we're, what are we doing? We're comparing or juxtaposing Jesus Christ with who? Who is following? Good, Aaron and the Levitical priesthood, right? So in order to understand ver, uh, verse 1, look at chapter 5, verse 1. Paul is, by the way, writing this letter to Jewish, uh, new Jewish converts to Christianity about 64 AD, 65 AD for a context and historical backdrop. This is about six years before the destruction of Jerusalem, which we've been dealing with on Friday night. OK, so that temple is getting ready to come down like our master said. And so Jews that left Christianity to go back to that would be in in major trouble. Look at verse 1. <clears throat> Paul says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men and things pertaining to God, right? And here's the reason, the purpose, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. But the first thing I want you to see is the word for. What is the word for, therefore? What is the word for, therefore? Oh, 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 what's his purpose? The word for there points back to what was said in the preceding cause, okay? Which means in chapter 4, the high priesthood of Christ was already referred to. So in order for us to understand it, and I thought about having elders start back at verse 14 and then read through our text, but I thought some people would be like, whoa, what, what are we doing? So I felt like I would just kind of touch on it when we got up here. So go back to verse 14 of chapter 4. Remember, the chapter breaks are not inspired. Chapter breaks. The translators put those there, but they're not inspired. So they all, it all goes together as one consistent letter. So verse 14, Paul says, seeing then that we have a, not a high priest, a what? Great high priest, because Christ is superior to the other priests, right? You know what I love about that? The word a. We have a great high priest. That means there ain't no other high priest. That means you and I don't have the authority to call any other man a high priest. And, and nor do we have biblical sanction to go to another man to confess our sins to him as if he's a priest. We have one priest at the right hand of God. It's not Mary. It's not angels. It's not dead saints. It's the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? All right. He's the only one. That means not even your pastor is your high priest. That's why we don't have altar calls. You don't come to me to get to him. You come to him by faith. By faith. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, that's his resurrection and subsequent ascension to the right hand of God. What's his name? Jesus, the son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Right. And then he goes on talking about his qualities that he can sympathize with us. He can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. I love that. We got a high priest in heaven that cares about us and that knows what we're going through. And you know what he says to us? Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you, right? He cares about us. So in light of the high priesthood of Christ, now look at verse 5. For every high priest, okay, okay, it's connected with the high priesthood of Jesus mentioned in the previous chapter. Now what Paul is doing is he's comparing the high priesthood of Christ to Aaron. Remember, Paul is writing to Jewish converts from Judaism to Christianity that are struggling struggling with the sufficiency of Christ and tempted to go back to Judaism as if leaving Judaism for Christianity would leave them high priestless. Leaving Judaism for Christianity does not leave them high priestless. It gives them an even more superior and more glorious high priest than they had under the old covenant, doesn't it? Right, right. And so he wants them to know that they have a priest. And what he does here is he actually goes through the qualifications for the Old Testament priest. We're going to be looking at that here in a minute. It shows how Christ not only meets all those qualifications, but exceeds them all. All right. Now, verse one. It says, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men. See that? And things pertaining to God, right? Sounds good, but let's mute it till church is over. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. And then it says that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. So point one on your outline. Look at point one on your outline. <clears throat> it says the calling, service, and qualities of the Levitical high priest. Now, Paul, again, starts off comparing Christ's priesthood, Hebrews 4.14, 
to Aaron's, to Aaron's priesthood to demonstrate his validity as well as the sufficiency and superiority of the high priesthood of Jesus. Look at verse 4 real quick. He goes on to say, no man takes this honor unto himself. We're going to talk about that. But he that is called of God as was who? See the comparison now? See the comparison? Right, the Aaronic priesthood with Christ's priesthood, which is really a Melchizedekian priesthood. When we get to chapter 7, we're going to try to unpack that. I can't wait to get there. But you'll have references to it in chapter 5 leading up to uh, chapter 7. But if you're uh, in point 1, look at letter A. Let's start there. <clears throat> one of the qualities of being a priest under that old covenant system is letter A. They were chosen by God from among men. See it? They were chosen by God from among men, as Aaron was. That's what we just saw in verse 4. So I want you to see his calling and qualities. I want you to see the high priesthood's calling and qualities. Please turn with me to Exodus 28. There's a lot of places we can go. <clears throat> We're just going to look at a few. We are going back to survey the calling and appointing of the high priest in the Old Testament. And in fact, we'll see Aaron and his sons who were called... They were the descendants of Levi. The priesthood came out of the loins of Levi, didn't it? Right. Is everybody in Exodus chapter 28? And there, oh, there's so much here. I, I'm, I'm going to want to just touch on a few things here. The high priest's attire, his garment, his dress, his office. There's so much here that's really, really glorious. Um, <clears throat> but we'll, we'll, we'll try to condense it for time's sake. But look at the first verse. Okay, now we're considering him being chosen, the high priest being chosen by God. Verse 1, <clears throat> the Lord says to Moses, he says, Take thou unto thee who? Aaron, there he is, your brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel. So you're to call them out. They have to be men. They're selected out of men for the purpose of representing men. From among the children of Israel, here's his purpose, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Okay. And now watch who he names off. Even Aaron, that's the high priest, and Nadab and Abihu. We know what happened to them, don't we? And Eleazar and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. So Aaron was a high priest and his sons were appointed priests. A great type of our relationship to Jesus. If you want to write it down, Aaron here is a type of Christ. Aaron in the Hebrew means light bearer. Who is the light of the world? Jesus Christ, right? And we're everything that Jesus is in him. If Christ is a priest in a secondary sense, we're also what? Priests. Right. We're going to touch on that too. Right. And aren't we his sons? Yeah. Look at verse 2. And he says, uh, Moses, this is what I want you to do. You shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. So these are his high priestly garments that would set him apart from the rest of the people. Beautiful, glorious garments. They were a purple and they were blue and they were crimson color. And they were also a fine twine linen, a white color. All of those colors have beautiful significance. I want you to see it here. Verse 3 he says, you shall speak. Unto all that are wise hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, to set him apart for his office, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Look at verse 4. And these are the garments which they shall make a breastplate, and an ephod, and a robe, and a broidered coat, and a mitre. That's his hat. And it actually had a crown on it too that said holiness to the Lord. And a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. One more verse. And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. Y'all see the colors there? Each one of those has a beautiful spiritual significance. If you want to just kind of jot it down real quick and we'll keep it moving. What's the significance of the gold? Glory. Glory. And it signifies that this high priest really points to Jesus Christ, who is the... Uh, the revelation of the glory of God, but also gold symbolizes being a king, symbolizes Christ as a king, which underscores his Melchizedekian priesthood because he was not only a priest, but he was a what? A king priest. Is Christ a king priest? Does he have all power in heaven and earth placed in his hands? Yeah, that's right. It also underscores his deity. He's the God man and the blue. What's the blue signify? Jesus is the word from heaven who came down from heaven. The purple signifies Christ's royalty, king of kings and lord of lords. And what's the scarlet? That's the red. That's the deep 
dark red color, the crimson color, which is a foreshadow of the sufferings of Christ and the shedding of his blood by which our sins would be remitted. Y'all see the gospel there? Right. All, all of these things were foreshadows of Christ. And the fine twine linen uh, would be uh, white, and, and that would point to the purity and sinlessness of Jesus Christ, who had no sin, no spot, no blemish. Is that true? That's why we love him, isn't it? All right, so you can see his garb, and if you uh, will, let me see here. I'm going to have you go down to verse 9, and like I said, I'll try to be brief on this. It, <clears throat> it would be wonderful to go through this whole chapter and to look at the garments, but this is interesting. He had something on his shoulders. The high priest had something in his shoulders. Look at verse 9 in his ephod, and it says, you shall take two onyx stones Engrave on them the names of the children of Israel. So how many tribes of Israel was there? Twelve. And so if you had two stones, how many, how many names would be on each stone? Six, which is the number of man. And Christ is bearing them in his shoulders. He came to bear the wrath of God in the place of believing mankind. And there's six names on this side and six names on that side. And he's bearing them on his shoulder. The shoulder in the scripture symbolizes power and strength. It's Christ by his power and might that, that he bore his people and bore their sins. Bore Calvary's cross on his broad shoulders up to Golgotha to atone for our sins. Is that true? Okay, and it says here you're going to engrave them. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the children of Israel. You know, he didn't write with a marker. <laughs> right? He, he engraved it. You know what that means? We are permanently in Christ. And Christ is permanently in us. And we are permanently united to Jesus Christ. Right. And then it says in verse 10, six of their names on the stone, on one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their both. And aren't we living stones in Jesus Christ? Yeah, that's right. And Christ is the rock upon which the church is built, isn't he? Yeah, we can go on and on with that as well. Now, for time's sake, go down to verse 15. I want you to see something of his breastplate. The high priest also had a breastplate. And this is beautiful. Verse 15. It says, you shall make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. So the breastplate of judgment, it can be translated breastplate of decision. Okay, those precious stones that were in his, uh, in his uh, breastplate. And he also had something called an urim and thummim. And we're told, we don't know a whole lot about it, but we're told that those stones were there by which God uh, might have been pleased at times to reveal his will to the priest. We don't know exactly how that would be if one stone would light up, light up for yes and, or another one would light up for no. But he would have those there and, and they can be translated the breastplate of decision by which God would make his will known to them. But also breastplate of judgment would signify the high priest being uh, uh, the... Uh, are having demonstrating government all over all of national Israel. Under God, the high priest was the highest position in the church. All of Israel, listen, all of Israel was dependent upon the success of the high priest. If the high priest offered a sacrifice to God and God accepted it, everybody was accepted. But if the high priest offered a sacrifice to God, listen, and God rejected the high priest, that means God rejected everybody that the high priest represented. Do you see the connection be between us and Christ? Because God accepted Christ, he therefore accepted everyone that was in him. Christ is our federal head and representative of the whole believing elect race. Okay. Now let's, let's take it further. Oh, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say here there is at least a secondary allusion here. Verse 15, where it says, you shall make the breastplate of judgment. Did not Christ bear the judgment of God in our place for all of his people? Now, how many stones were in the breastplate? There were 12, a, a stone for each tribe of Israel. So Christ bears the names of all his elect people on his heart, on his heart. That shows our union with Christ, but also his love for us. The other thing that's interesting is verse 16. Oh, let me finish verse. You should make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. And after the work of the ephod, shall you make it? So it'd be the same colors of, of gold, of blue, and of purple, of scarlet, and a fine twine linen, shall you make it? Now look at verse 16. This is interesting. Look at the shape. Four square. Why is it four square? You see that? 
four square, this breastplate was four square, it was in the shape of a perfect square. Four square, it shall be being doubled, a span shall be the length thereof, and a span thereof shall be the breadth. This is remarkable. And verse 17 says there's four rows, so write that down. Four square, four rows. Four square, four rows. We know the number four in the Bible is the number for what? Universality. This is a beautiful spiritual reality that Jesus Christ is the mediator and high priest of all of his believing elect from the four corners of the world. Uh, Jews and Gentiles from every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation. You see the four corners? Kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation. And there's four rows for all who believe there is a, uh, an atonement that is applied universally to all believers, all who believe on him, not to those who don't believe on him. That's important to know. It's, listen, it's important to make the distinction that Jesus Christ did not shed his blood in vain for one person who does not believe on him. Does that make sense? God's redemption plan was not a shotgun redemption plan by which he just shot a bunch of pellets and hoped he would hit some people. I told us before, God's a weapon of choice out of heaven is a what? Is an arrow. Is an arrow. And he shoots, lovingly, savingly shoots as our heavenly Cupid shoots the arrow of his grace and the arrow of his gospel penetrating one heart at a time. And he never misses. And he never misses. Not one drop of blood that was shed at the cross was, was shed in vain. That's important to know. And in verse 21, and then we need to get back to our text. Verse 21, it says, and the stone shall be with the names of the children of Israel. How many? Twelve. According to their names, like the engravings of a signet, every one with his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. So let's go back to our text. I just wanted you to <clears throat> see a little bit of the high priest. No, no, you know what? I can't take you back. I got to show you one more thing. Please, Leviticus 21. Because Hebrews tells us that the high priests were selected out of men, right? That means they didn't select their selves. Did you know that there were uh, prerequisites to be a high priest? That means in, anybody just walking up off the street couldn't be a high priest. Did y'all know that? There were certain qualities. Like in the New Testament, there are pastoral qualifications for those that can be in leadership, right? In the New Testament, we have the pastoral epistles. Now I'm going to read some verses to you, and I hope it, they don't sound harsh. I hope this, this doesn't sound harsh. I want you to be able to see the uh, redemptive significance of it. Leviticus 21, <clears throat> watch what it says in verse 13. So we know that we just saw in, in Exodus 28 that the high priest could not call himself. He had to be called of God like Aaron was. <laughs> but notice these qualifications, Leviticus 21, verse 13. And let me, let me give you a little redemptive grid. When you interpret the scriptures, particularly the Old Testament scriptures, you've got to have your redemptive glasses on or the scriptures will not make sense. So you want to write this down. Jesus Christ is the key to the scriptures. Jesus Christ is the key to the scriptures. That's very important. Can we uh, get up a verse to um, substantiate that? If that's a new uh, reality, uh, uh, there are a bunch of verses. John 5, 39. L let's use that one. Put that up on the overhead. And just stay with me in Leviticus 21. We're going to work our way through this. And you can relax. It'll take us two weeks to get through all of these. Uh, <clears throat> more than likely. We'll see. Um, jo yeah, John 5, 39. Jesus said this. He says, you are searching the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Okay, so Jesus says that all the scriptures are about who? Are about him. So we have the privilege and honor to go digging and looking for Christ in the Old Testament. So you got to do that with this. There it is. You got to do that with this passage. <clears throat> okay, Leviticus 21. Now, watch what these uh, uh, restrictions are, our criteria for high priests. It says in verse uh, 13, it says, He shall take a wife in her virginity, so she had to be a virgin, a widow or a divorced woman or profane. Or a harlot, these shall he not take. He can't marry one of them. But he shall take a virgin of his own people to wife. Why is that? Because the high priest here ultimately points to who? Right, and how would we describe the church? Before salvation, we're all harlots. But after salvation, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 describes the church as a what? Pure, chaste, virgin for Christ. Isn't that right? 
All of our harlotry and past whoredoms and transgressions are washed away by the blood of Christ. Now we are pure in God's sight and we are chaste virgins married to Jesus. Aren't you thankful? Yeah, that's how God sees us. That's what this is pointing to. Look at the next verse. Neither shall he profane his seed among his people, for I, the Lord, do sanctify him. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of your seed in their generation that has any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. So if he had a blemish on him, a mark, uh, uh, like a big old a birthmark or some kind of disfiguring characteristic on his face, he wasn't qualified. Look at verse 17. Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of your seed in their generations that has any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. Verse 18. For whatsoever man he be that has a blemish, he shall not approach. A blind man or a lame or he that has a flat nose. That's kind of tough, isn't it? <laughs> uh, or anything superfluous. Okay. If he had like fluid or an issue coming out of him, he was not qualified. Uh, it, then it goes on to say, uh, or a man that's broken footed or broken handed or crook backed, kind of like this, like, like bent over his scoliosis, can't be a priest or a dwarf or that has a blemish in his eye or be scurvy or scab. or has his Lord Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Right, right. This is, this is not be mean to people. Right. It, it's, it's pointing to the glorious high priest to come. Let's go back to our text. He had no sin. He, he did no sin. And, and in him was no sin. He was holy and, and harmless and undefiled. And what? Separate from sinners. That's right. That's what that points to. So let's go back and keep it moving. Hebrews 5. Let's go to letter B on your outline. Let her be, and let's see if we can work through this a little bit. <clears throat> Letter B says, chosen by God to serve on behalf of men. So the priest was chosen out from men in order to represent men toward God. Here's a good way to, to re remember the distinction between a priest and a prophet. Okay, The priest's job is to uh, uh, represent men toward God. The prophet's job is to speak for or represent God toward men. Can you see the difference there? Everybody got that? The high priest goes to God on behalf of men. And the priest goes for God toward men on behalf of God. Right. So he's from men. Verse 1. Verse 1 tells us that he was chosen for men. Every high priest taken from where? From among men is ordained what? For men. So from men, for men. From men, for men. Does everybody get that? So from men means not from an angel. Now we're back in Hebrews 2, right? Right. When Christ came into the world, he didn't come in mere spirit form. He took on what? A real body. Real flesh and blood. This is why he can relate with us. We have a high priest that can relate with us. He became a real man, flesh and blood, and was tempted in all points, yet without what? Without sin. All right. So very important. And you want to write down the word mediator. This is describing the priest and the role of a mediator. His job was to stand between you and God and render those things that God requires on the sinner's behalf. To render toward God those things that God requires on the sinner's behalf. 
okay? So his job was to represent men. Here it would be Israel in the Old Testament, uh, uh, mediating for them toward God those things that God required. Now notice what it says he offered at the end of verse 1. It says um, <clears throat> that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. So was the priest supposed to make atonement? Yes. Now, is there a distinction here between gifts and sacrifices? There is uh, a, a small distinction. Those gifts there could be like, like free will offerings, uh, uh, thank offerings. They would be, the, the, the word here is Dora. Dora, and it refers to gifts. These would be things, listen, that would be given on behalf of the people to God that was not strictly required. This, it would be a gift that was not compulsory. It would be freely given, like a free will offering to God, okay? But whatever you gave to God, you had to give it through who? The priest, right? God always deals with people with a go-between, with a mediator, okay? So these would be gifts, and they, they would typically be bloodless. Not all the time. There are exceptions to the rule, but typically gifts here would be bloodless. And then the word sacrifices would typically be bloody. Everybody get that distinction? Bloodless, bloody, bloodless, bloody. There were both types of sacrifices and offerings in the Old Testament. But I said typically, not all the time. There are exceptions to that, too. Uh, but the sacrifices would be those required sacrifices that God required. And they were they were compulsory and they would typically be animals and the word thusios is the Greek term, and it refers to a sacrificial victim, like a lamb or a bullock, right? Interesting. Can I get up numbers 15, uh, tw um, t uh, 25 on the overhead? Let's get that up. You know what's the trip? While he's putting up numbers 15, 25, I want you to see, go down to verse 2 in our text. This priest says he can have compassion on the ignorant, on the what? Ignorant and them that are out of the way. Did you know that in the Old Testament, the sacrifices that were offered to God were only for the ignorant? They were only for sins that were committed inadvertently. They were, they were only um, offered to atone for sins that were committed unintentionally. Did you know in the Old Testament there was no atonement or sacrifice for deliberate high-handed sins? Did y'all know that? So, in the New Testament, we're told that there's a such thing as an unpardonable sin in the New Testament, right? 1 John 5. But there was a such thing as an unpardonable sin in the Old Testament as well. Deliberate, high-handed, in-your-face, I dare you to punish me type sins against God. There was no sacrifice for those sins. Today, the equivalent of that would be a high-handed, final, total, utter rejection of the gospel and turning away from the one sacrifice that atones for sin. If you reject the sacrifice of Christ, there is no other sacrifice for you. We need Christ bad, and he's the only way, okay? All right, watch this real quick. Numbers 15, 25. <clears throat> it says, and the who? The priest shall make an atonement for all the congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them. For it is what? Ignorance, like we're seeing in our text. And they shall bring their offering, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord, and their sin offering before the Lord for their what? Ignorance. One more verse. For their ignorance. Okay. Uh, take comfort, you're a true believer. It's impossible for you to commit the type of sin that's unpardonable. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's, it's impossible for a true believer who's truly converted by the grace of God to commit the unpardonable sin. I'm so thankful because if it wasn't for the grace of God, we would do it. But he keeps us. And it says, and it shall be forgiven all the congregation of the children of Israel. They were dependent upon that high priest offering. And the stranger that sojourns among them, seeing all the people were in what? Ignorance, right? Ignorance. Isn't that what Paul said? That God had mercy on me because I didn't know what I was doing. Remember? Yeah, that's 1 Timothy 1.13. I did it in ignorance. Right. He didn't, he didn't sin against Christ with his eyes open. So the priest is critically important in the Old Testament. And he pointed to our need of the high priest in the New Testament. Go to 1C, please. <clears throat> the next point is the chosen man must have compassion to teach and help others. Let's make some applications to ourselves. I want to make some applications to ourselves, and I'm going to make this a little bit earlier than I was planning to. You and I have a call to a priesthood. 
not in the classic sense. So I'm not contradicting what I said earlier that there are no priests today. Jesus is the high priest. But there is a sense, a spiritual sense, in a secondary sense, in which you and I have a type of priesthood that we're called to. And I hope to make that um, clear. And then I'm going to say a couple of things that might be a little challenging, might hurt a little bit. <clears throat> but hopefully the Lord will help us with it. Okay, 1C, it says the chosen man must have compassion to help others. That's verse 2. Watch this description of the Old Testament high priest, and it should describe believers today as well. It definitely describes Christ. It says that not only does he offer sacrifices for sins, look at verse 2. Who can have compassion on the ignorant? See God's mercy toward the ignorant? And on them that are out of the way. If God is merciful to the ignorant, shouldn't we be merciful to the ignorant? We were once ignorant too. And even now we ain't got it all together, right? We don't know it all now, right? Paul says if any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. That humbles us, doesn't it? All right. What does he mean here? Let me finish the verse. He says for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. So the Old Testament high priest, as valuable and important as he was, he was still a sinner. You and I, even in, our, even in Christ, being regenerated and born again, on one hand, we're the very righteousness of God in Christ, right? But on the other hand, we're still sinners. So you want to write it down. You and I are simultaneously sinful and righteous at the same time. We just have to deal with that paradox, right? We're, we're, we're still a mess. We're the, we're the righteousness of God in Christ, but in ourselves, we're still a mess. We're a whip, work in process. God is working on us, right? There's bolts flying, screws and, and uh, uh, hammers and nails and stuff falling all over the place. Sawdust, right? God is working on us. All right. Um, and, and the Old Testament high priest was compassed with infirmity. He had a sin nature. He struggled with like passions. Um, what does he mean here by compassion? Look at verse 2. It's not your typical New Testament word for compassion. Typically, compassion would be either the word elios or uh, splagnos, like uh, your bowels, being moved in your bowels with pity and, and mercy and all that. That's not the word here. This is the interesting word. Ready? The word here for compassion. Ready? It, it literally means, right, get this, metered, metered, M-E-T-E-R, like you have a meter, you know, when Smud and PG&E comes to your house and they check your meter. Right? Why is my smud bill so high? Check your meter. Right? You need to turn them lights off a little bit and turn the AC down. All those kind of things, right? Metered. Metered. The word is metered passion. Metered pathos. So he's saying the high priest has to have metered passion. Regulated passion. You use a meter to regulate something, right? To see where it's at. Y'all with me? Right? Metered passion. This was the quality that the high priest had, had to have. And this is a quality you need to have if you're going to reach sinners. You got to be patient with people. You have to be gentle with people. You got to put up with people. I know we don't like that, but somebody put up with us, right? Right. And somebody was patient with us. You got to be willing to take hits from your family members on your knees, praying for them, being patient and long suffering with like 27 O's. Preaching and praying, preaching and praying, taking hits, preaching and praying, taking hits, preaching and praying. You block sometimes, but, but preaching and praying and being patient that God might convert them. Jesus waited 33 years for his siblings to be saved. And we're ready to give up after two or three months. Right? Yeah. Right. So be gentle and mild. Long-tempered, regulated passion. Now the word ignorant. See that there? It means to be without understanding or to not know, to be without understanding, to be unaware, unaware. We just saw in the Old Testament there was a sacrifice for those that were unaware, right? Christ is a sacrifice for those that are unaware. But once the gospel comes, who repent of their sins, turn from their sins and believe on him. He promises to forgive. So we need to be patient with those that are ignorant. And then last, you see the word out of the way? Does your translation say out of the way? It says out of the way. You want to write this down, it means to be misguided. A lot of people are in false churches where they're misguided under false, pro false preachers who, who are not preaching the truth and they're misguided. And so then you come and give them the truth and they look at you like you're crazy, right? It, it, that shouldn't be so, uh, so surprising to us because it wasn't that long ago when it was us, right? 
Many of us were misled. We were um, uh, Balaam's uh, donkey, and we were being read by, or, uh, written by a false prophet until the angel of the Lord came with the sword of the word and reveal the truth to us, right? So they're out of the way. It means to be misled or to be misguided. It's where we get the English word planet. Plane, plane, like a cosmological uh, a body that's on a fixed axis, but like a shooting star that veers off and errs. The word can be translated err and goes out of the way. This is where many people are. This is where our nation is. This is where our nation is. Erring, erring on the verge of an enormous calamity and catastrophe. Now, what should you and I do about this? I want you to write down two words. Can I get it? Leviticus 10, 10. What should you and I do with this? We're in the midst of a culture that is erring in a nation that is erring that says we don't need God and we don't need his word anymore. But David already told us that the nation that forgets God shall be turned where? Into hell, into hell. So how should we feel about it? Should we be fatalistic? Should we say, well, you know, it ain't no hope for our nation. So let's just throw our hands up and forget about it. Right. And all things are already predestined anyway. So why should we even try? The Bible doesn't ever warrant that kind of thinking. Faith always produces optimism. You want to write that down. Faith always produces optimism. Remember the Israelites, this was a chapter before they perished in the wilderness because when they heard the word, it was not mixed with faith. They didn't believe it. Right. God, you brought us out here to kill us. But there was two boys that were full of optimism. Who were they? Joshua and Caleb. We can make it. Let's go. Right. So faith should fill you with optimism to continue to preach and to pray in hope that God will turn your nation. Nothing is impossible to our God. As messed up as our nation is. If I didn't believe that God could turn it around, I wouldn't be up here preaching. I wouldn't be up here preaching if I didn't believe in the power of God. So you got two jobs. Number one, to teach. Number two, to judge. I know we're told not to judge, right? But the Bible says you're supposed to judge. Okay, I'm going to prove it to you. So don't get mad at me. Look at Leviticus 10.10. Leviticus 10.10 is describing the role of the priest in the Old Testament. It says, and that you, the priest here, that you may put difference between holy and unholy and between clean and unclean. That's a judgment. Today we live in a reprobate culture that is not able to determine the difference between light and darkness, right and wrong, and good and evil. It's change evil and replace it with good and vice versa. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20. Don't we live in a reprobate culture today? A reprobate mind is a mind that can no longer function the way God designed it. It no longer has the noeo, noea ability to uh, differentiate between right and wrong and good and evil. And it is a passive judgment by which God turns a nation over that forgets God. This is where we are right now. So we have to judge while we still have some sense, right? Since we haven't gone totally insane yet, right? We need to judge. But what is the mechanism by which you and I are called to judge? What's it? It's in your lap. What do we call it? The Bible. And doesn't the New Testament say prove what? All things and hold fast to that which is good. You are to use the, the codified and scripture rated canon. Did y'all know you got a canon in your lap? You got a canon in your lap, right? You know, kind of like a thing that blows up, but it's really the term canon there refers to a measuring rod. We're to judge all things based on the word of God. But to do that, we have to know God's word, don't we? Right. But the priest is supposed to make a difference between holy and unholy, clean and unclean. That's judging. We're called to judge. When you hear people say that you should not judge, they just judge. That it's not right to judge. Did you guys hear what I said? When, when a person says, hey, don't judge, it's not right to judge. They just contradicted themselves by judging, making a judgment that it's wrong to judge. So they just judge. We are to judge, but we're to judge righteous judgment, Jesus said. Okay, that's John 7, 24. One more verse, verse 11, and we'll keep it moving here. <clears throat> Verse 11. So this is our call as priests to judge, but we're also called to teach. Jesus says to go out into all the world and make disciples, didn't he? Can we get verse 11 up there? Um, if not, I'll turn it. Okay. No, that's 10-1. Having some technical difficulties. Okay. It's up there now. All right. Look what it says here. <clears throat> that you may what? Teach. We're called to teach. This is why we strive 
to have biblical, sound, expository preaching three times a week here. I know sometimes I get a little, little long-winded, pray for me, right? Pray that God will give you grace too, right? We need an hour, an hour and 10, 12 minutes of preaching so we can grow and go deeper in the word of God. Don't we? So we're not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Listen, you're never going to grow in your understanding of the gospel with 15 minutes of preaching and two hours of music. You will not grow that way. You will not grow that way. Ask God to build up your spiritual muscles to go deep and to be able to endure. God will bless it. He'll bless it if you do it. But he says that you may teach the children of Israel. Teach, teach. We need teaching. Teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. We need teaching. We need to be under teaching. Listen, and then listen, then you need to go out and teach. A lot of people say, well, it's just a pastor's job. Let me give you the card, come to church and hear the preaching. And they think that that's the end of their job. No, that's just the beginning. Sometimes they need to hear the gospel preached from you. Sometimes they need the gospel preached from you. And, and here's what I'm concerned about. I want you to write this down. Today in, in 2024 in the United States, we live in the most biblically illiterate age ever. Did you guys see what I just said? Right now, 2024, particularly in the United States, we live in the most biblically illiterate age ever. And we, got, we have exposure to the word of God. You got it on your phone. Right? We're without excuse. Um, there is a, um, you can look this up in your own time, Evangelical Research Firm. The Evangelical uh, Research Firm, it, it's Lifeway Research Survey. I'm just going to give you an example from one survey. There's tons of them out there. Uh, but Lifeway Research Survey, it's an evangelical research firm. They did, a re they did a survey, and one study surveyed adult American households here in the United States. And you know what they found? That 87% of American adult households have a Bible. They own a Bible, about, about 87%. But only 11% of those people have read all the way through the Bible. 11%. And out of those large numbers, only 30% of that group read a few verses or a few passages out of the Bible. We're in a very, very dark time. Most Americans couldn't pass a simple, basic Bible literacy test. Most Christians, if their life depended on it, couldn't tell you what the Ten Commandments were. Most American citizens... Couldn't tell you, couldn't quote a Bible. Have you ever seen, the, I saw YouTube videos where there were people, I don't know what church they were from, but they were going through the store and walking up to random people and saying, hey, I'll give you $100 if you can tell me one Bible verse. I'm serious. $100? Right? It, it, Jesus wept. You can't say that. <laughs> right? They couldn't quote one Bible verse. It's really sad, isn't it? We live in a very, very dark time. But God already told us in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, my people perish because of a what? A lack of knowledge. And the Bible says that eternal life is knowing God. But you can't know God apart from his word. Right. Yes, we're talking about a personal, experiential, saving knowledge of God in Hosea 4, 6 and John 17, 3. But you can't have that without his word. You can't have that without his word. So, so that, should fire, that should fire you up to go deeper in the word of God in 2024 than you went last year. That should produce a, a, what I call a holy dissatisfaction in you. Lord, help me to spend more time in your word. Lord, help me to be better equipped to know your word for my own soul and growth, but that I would be more equipped to evangelize when I go out and people ask me a question. You, you got to get to the point where you're tired of people asking you basic Bible questions and you can't give an answer. If somebody comes to you and they say, well, how is Jesus the only way? And you can't answer that. But you say you love Christ and you want to see people say that should light a fire in you. I'll tell you this. I'll make a, a little application. Years, years ago, when the Lord had first saved me, I was I was so on fire. I want to see people saved, but I could not remember scripture. And it ate me up. And so I would get into conversations with people. Sometimes they'd be conversations. Sometimes they'd be battles. Um, but, you know, you're on fire. You just want to see people saved. Right. And they would ask me questions and I couldn't answer it. 
And I know I heard it in the sermon, but I couldn't retain it and then have it when I needed it. And it ate me up. And I had to get to a low point where I was almost depressed. I, I couldn't take it anymore. I said, Lord, I'm, I'm willing and ready to spend as much time in your word as necessary to take it and do what David says. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And that I'll be better prepared to defend spiritual battles and be able to communicate the truth that people might be saved. If you love God, you should have a desire to defend him and to stand for his glory and honor. Do you have that desire going on inside of you? See, that's a sort of litmus test as to where we are in our growth. You know that you're mature when you care about the glory of God and you care about lost sinners being saved. And then you get to a point where it's not all on somebody else. Now you say, Lord, what can I do? What can I do? How, how can I be a participant in this? How can I, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, be a co-laborer together with God and not always just put it on somebody else? No, God has called you to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. And you know, for that, for, for us, it means having already gone right where you are. We're already in the world. Right on your job, it, 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 to your neighbors, at the park, at the gym. Y'all you know, know we got a sauna, we got a sauna ministry, right? We be hitting the weights and we get in the sauna. We be looking for opportunities to preach the gospel. Way of grace men are preaching the gospel everywhere we go. But it should be our desire to do it more and more and more. More and more. And, and can I get up uh, Acts eleven thirteen? 13? I, I want to say this because uh, I, I believe uh, preaching should have at least an element of refutation in it to deal with misnomers, um, false sayings and false teaching and stuff. You and I have heard Acts eleven thirteen. if we can get it up on the overhead. We've been uh, told that, you know, you, you don't really have to say anything to anybody. You just, just live out the gospel. You ever, you ever heard that? Right. You just call to be a walking sermon, and that's all, all you need to do is just uh, walk right before people, and people will be saved. I still haven't found that verse yet. Have you... Have you found the walking sermon Bible verse? <laughs> I'm still trying to find it. Somebody help me, right? We, all we need to be is a walking servant. Now, we should be living out the gospel. Don't get me wrong. We need to be walking according to God's statutes. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works. Glorify your Father, which is in heaven, right? But that ain't enough to save people. People are saved through words. Did you hear what I said? People are saved through words. And, and I think somebody probably came up with that walking sermon thing because now it takes away your responsibility for you to have to spend time in the Word. Now you can be lazy. All I got to do is just walk in front of people. I ain't never seen nobody get converted by watching you walk. <laughs> right? Look at Acts eleven thirteen. A couple more letters and then, <clears throat> then hopefully we'll be there. Verse 13, it says, and he showed us how this is the angel that told Cornelius to send a preacher to his house, and it was the apostle Peter that came, okay? And Peter is recounting this to his Jewish brethren that didn't know why he went to a Gentile's house. It says, he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, and in verse 14, who shall walk before you and you'll be saved. Is that what it says? No. Well, who shall tell you words? words whereby you and all your house shall be saved what does that tell us people are saved by words they're saved by words not by watching you walk now walking out the gospel is very important and god may use that to open the door to cause people to want to hear what you have to say but if they're going to be saved faith comes by hearing and hearing by the right by words the glorious words of the gospel the person and work of jesus christ that's very important. And that's what we're called to do. And we're to do it in patience and gentleness with the ignorant and those that are out of the way. We have an out of the way nation. We have an out of the way culture, an out of the way world, an out of the way society. And it, and it calls for men and women who know the way. The way is a person. To point people to the way by which they might be saved. Is that your desire? Do you have a burning desire to see the lost saved? Many people don't. I pray that God's generating that in you. Let's go to 1D. Let's hurry up. 1D. <clears throat> this this will be pretty easy. Um, the one who offers also needs the offering. That's pretty, pretty straightforward. Look at verse 3. You can see it here. 
Verse 3, it says, by reason hereof, he ought, the, the priest, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for what? Very simply, that means the high priest is offering a sacrifice for the sins of the people, but he got his own sins that need to be atoned for. Hey, that's Aaron, but that ain't Christ. That's Aaron and the Levitical priesthood, but not Christ. See how Jesus' priesthood is superior? The priesthood, he had to offer sins for others and for himself. Christ only had to offer uh, sacrifice for other people's sins because he didn't have any sins of his own. Isn't that beautiful? So I imagine, um, can we get up uh, uh, 1 Peter 2.22? See, I love those easy memory verses. You better steal those. 1 Peter 2.2.2. Two, two, two. Now you don't have no excuse not to remember God's word. Isn't that easy? 1 Peter 2.2.2. Two, two, two. There's a bunch of them in the scriptures like that. Start with those as like, like, a, like a sort of mnemonic that will help you retain the word. I, I love those. Um, I wonder what Jesus must have said when he went to John the Baptist's uh, baptism. John was baptizing people under repentance and confession of sin. What did Jesus have to repent of? That would have been interesting, right? Okay, so typically when they come up here, they confess their sins. Well, I don't have any sins to confess, okay? Uh, typically they have to repent of sins. I don't have any sins to repent of. That would have been interesting, huh? But he had to be the sinner's substitute, the spotless lamb without sin, to go and be baptized in our place on behalf of sinners. That makes sense. So it had to be spotless. Watch this. First Peter 2, 22, talking about Christ, it says he did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. No deceit, no trickery, no lies, never lied. Never lied. You and I don't know what that's like. Uh, while we're in Peter, 1 Peter 1.19, and we'll keep it moving. 1 Peter 1.19 is a beautiful one. While he's putting this up, Jesus said in another place, which of you can convince me of sin? That's what Jesus said. And the rulers were speechless. 1 Peter 1.19, <clears throat> another one while he's putting it up. 1 John 3.5. 1 John 3.5, it says, and in him is no sin. No sin. Where are believers? In Christ. Therefore, believers in Christ also have what? No, is that good? In Jesus. All right, watch this. Verse 18 says, you were not redeemed with silver and gold after the tradition of your fathers, right? Those things can never put your sin away. Indulgences can't pay for your sin. Only the blood of Christ. Okay, verse 19. We weren't redeemed with those things, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without what? Blemish and without now it makes a little bit more sense why the high priest in the Old Testament couldn't have blemishes in spot because he was pointing to this man. See it? He was pointing to this man. All right. Okay, I think we got this one. Um, I'm just going to say this to you. Um, <clears throat> this is important because the Protestant church today is being assaulted with what I said earlier called neo-Catholicism. There is a movement that's taking place right now in the church to move away from salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to grace plus. And, and there is now this, this movement, this pushing to convince Christians today, if you haven't heard it, you will, that, that coming to God through Jesus is not sufficient. You need to pray to dead saints. You need to pray to Mary. You need to pray to angels. And a lot of Christians, I, I've seen some of these Christian pod, podcasts, and they're just, they're, they're listening to them, and um, they have no defense. I'm not saying everyone, I know that there are good Christian apologists out there that are going to bat uh, against uh, these, but there are some uh, that were purported to be sound defenders of the faith that don't have an answer for these things. Number one, one of the reasons why you don't pray to dead saints is because that's necromancing. That's Deuteronomy chapter 18. Old Testament Israel and New Testament believers in Christ, because we are the, the true Israel of God, are prohibited from praying to the dead. We don't want to follow in the footsteps of King Saul that went to the witch of Endor to try to conjure up Samuel. It wasn't Samuel, it was a devil. Right? Dead people don't hear us. Absence from the body is present with the Lord if they're truly a believer. It's appointed unto man once to die and after this. The judgment. That means when we die, it's instant heaven or instant hell, and those souls don't come back and visit you or communicate with you. The only ones that can communicate with you would be evil spirits. We're forbidden to communicate with the dead. Moreover, the Bible says that there's only one mediator between God and man, and it's not Mary. 
And it's not a saint, and it's not an angel, and it's not the pastor, it's not the pope or a man in, a, in an outfit that calls himself a priest. It's Jesus Christ, the one mediator between God and man. He's the only one that can get you to the throne, that can get you to the Father, that can gain you righteousness, justification, and acceptance only through faith in his blood. Does that make sense? Anything else is sin and idolatry. All right, let's go to point two. We probably won't get any further than then this portion here, and that's okay. Uh, look at point two, the believer's call to a priestly life. I said this earlier, that you, that you and I are priests in a secondary sense, in a non-classic sense, okay? You don't have to put on a funny outfit. You are a priest positionally in Christ. So I want to put up a, a couple of verses to underscore that, and I hope that God will help us grow in our priesthood. Uh, can I get a 1 Peter 2, 8? No, let's turn to 1 Peter, it's close. Just two books to your right. Just turn there real fast to uh, 1 Peter 2. And then what we'll do is get Revelation 5, 9 on the overhead. <clears throat> okay, if you're in 1 Peter chapter 2, let's see what the apostle says here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. He says... And this is in reference to those Jews that, re that rejected the Son of God. And it says that, um, mm, verse, verse 7, Unto you therefore which believe, he's precious. He's precious to believers. But unto them which be disobedient or, un or unbelieving, the stone which the builders disallowed, the stone is Christ, the builders were the leaders, the Pharisees and scribes and so forth, which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. So Jesus is the foundation stone of the church, right? Now, verse 8, and a stone of stumbling. Christ is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at his word. These are those that have no capacity to receive the gospel. When they hear the gospel of Christ, they're offended at it like those Jews that crucified Jesus. And it says they stumble at his word. Listen, being disobedient whereunto also they were appointed. Whoa. Did you hear that? God appointed the rejection of Christ by the Jews. What do you mean appointed? It was already forewritten. It was already decreed by God before the foundation of the world. God did not make them sin. God is not the author of sin, but it was forewritten, known in the mind of God, and decreed before the foundation of the world. Does that make sense? It did not take God by surprise. In fact, it was written in Psalms 118, a thousand years before it even happened. Because God is able uh, uh, to declare the end from the beginning, isn't he? Right. But then look at this good news here. Verse 9. We're getting to the good news. All right, verse 9. He says, but you are a chosen generation. That's election, folks. God chose you to salvation. If you're a believer in Christ, it's because God chose you before the world began. And then a royal what? All right, get your t-shirt. Get your t-shirt, right? A royal priesthood. That's describing you. If you're in Christ, we have a priesthood, but it's also a royal priesthood, which means that we have a priesthood with Christ to mediate between God and others. But we also rule and reign with, with Christ, don't we? What should your priesthood look like? What should it look like for you and I to be priests? Can I give you a couple of things real quick? We won't go past point two. We'll see if we can get through ABC, but I won't go to point three. That'll be next week, Lord willing. OK, just hang in there with me a few more minutes. What should our priesthood look like? Number one, it should look like you praying for people, okay? Because that's your uh, office and your media. You are to be a type of mediator that stands between a holy God and a lost, dying world. You and I are called to be little mediators, like the Lord Jesus Christ is our great mediator, isn't he? The Bible also says in Mal Malachi 2.7, that the priest is supposed to keep knowledge on his lips. That means we're to learn the word of God, fear God, and make our, make our heart a treasury for the word of God that will have it prepared at demand on hand to go out and be ready to communicate the gospel with lost people that they might be saved. Priest is supposed to keep knowledge on his or her lips. Y'all write this down. 
Right. So we're to pray. We're to mediate, to be a sort of a great go between between us and others. And what we already learned is we're also to have compassion on the ignorant and those that are out of the way. Means you got to put up with people. You got to be patient with people, gentle with people, love people. And one more thing. We don't have a sacrifice to offer up like the Old Testament priest, but we do have a sacrifice to point to. That makes sense. You and I are to point people to the one sacrifice that takes away sin. The sacrifice of who? Jesus Christ, who hung on Calvary's tree to pay for their sins. Does that make sense? So we have a type of uh, priesthood and you and I are called to be a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Yeah, that's uh, that's Romans 12.1. That's another one. And we're to offer the sacrifice of our lips and praise and thanksgiving to God, aren't we? Right. So so there's many ways in which this is to occur. You can see this here. The priest's lips should keep knowledge. Those should be your lips. Now, one other verse that would underscore priesthood. It says, and this is describing you and I when we get to heaven. I told you God's able to see the end even from the beginning. He can already see us in heaven praising God. It says, and they sing a new song saying, you are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for you were slain. That's talking about Christ and has redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred, tongue, people and nation. See, see, God is not wrapped up in uh, CRT and race and ethnicity. God is saving people from every ethnic group, from every nook and cranny, from the four corners of the world. Isn't that beautiful? Heaven's going to be filled with people uh, uh, of every pigment, every skin tone, from every ethnic group all over heaven. It's going to be beautiful. And in verse 10, verse 10. And has made us unto God what? And what? Priest, and we shall reign on the earth in the new heaven and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Okay, that's what you and I um, are looking forward to because of what Christ did for us. So I already kind of explained here uh, what this should look like. So you, you should have a 2A. What does your priesthood look like? We've already developed it. So I'll just read it and we'll just go through it. Show compassion to the ignorant and commiserate with the lost. Okay, so you got to be patient and long-suffering with people. Look at letter B. Two more letters and we're, we're done. Your priesthood should also look like this, helping those that are out of the way. As I said earlier, we have an out of the way culture an out of the way nation, right? Out of the way communities. Uh, 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 we, we live in the midst of a world that doesn't know what a woman is. doesn't know what a man is. Don't even know where to use the bathroom. That's out of the way, isn't it? That's out of the way. And if we're in the light and we have the truth of Christ, we should be seeking to gently Guide people back into the way, which is a person. Pointing people to the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in the midst of a culture that thinks it's okay to butcher and mutilate children and change their genitalia. We live in the midst of an out of the way culture, don't we? We live in the midst of Moloch worship. Did y'all know that? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Moloch worship. Okay, right, right. The butchering of children in the Old Testament to offer them to that Old Testament God, Moloch. Today, it, it, Moloch worship is in the appearance of abortion. That's wrong. It's wrong. And you'd be surprised how many Christians advocate it. How many Christians say that, that, that it's right, that a woman has the right to choose? No, the woman's body belongs to God and so does the baby. So does the baby. What about God's right to choose? Right, right. So we got to get back to biblical truth. Okay. Now, most churches would tell us that we, we shouldn't deal with these kind of things. We should just be tolerant and silent and don't deal with any kind of political issues. But the problem with that is Jeremiah didn't do that. Elijah didn't do that. John the Baptist didn't do that. The Lord Jesus didn't do it. The Apostle Paul didn't do it in the New Testament either, didn't, did he? So we don't live in a spiritual silo. The word of God deals with the issues of our day, the issues of our fallen culture. And so we have to speak to these things, even if it means that we have to suffer, right? Even if it means we have to suffer. Our closing letter, I'm going to stop right here. 2C, let's go back and stop. Thank you for your patience. Let's, let's close with 2C. And we can go get some food. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. This is our closing thought for today. This is a good, good one for us to end on, okay? 
Um, 2C, it says, let your infirmities ground you and help you to relate with others. Everybody see that point there? All right, this is important. Where am I getting this? Hebrews chapter 5. It says in verse 2 and 3, we'll, we'll deal with uh, 5 and 6 next week, Lord willing. Again, Paul says that the high priest has to be one that can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way. Why? For that he himself is also compassed with infirmity. He's surrounded with infirmity. You and I wear a, a, a sin nature. Even though we've been regenerated, we have to drag around this corpse, as it were, Right? We have two natures, don't we? We have a new nature and an old nature that we have to battle with. If you're going to be a priest, this is a part of your priesthood, you, 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 you have to learn how to embrace your uh, infirmities, embrace your weakness, um, and embrace your depravity because that's the only way that other people around you will have hope. It's the only way that others around you will have hope. You have to have the ideology that apart from the grace of God, there go I. It produces humility in you. And it'll help you to be a little bit more patient with that other person that just doesn't get it. Because remember how long it took you to get it, right? That's important. So, but here's the problem when you don't embrace your infirmities. Paul knew how to embrace his infirmities. He learned to uh, uh, boast in his infirmities because he knew that when he was weak, then he was strong because it made him lead on Christ, Right? But when you don't own your infirmities, you make it harder for others to own their infirmities. Does that make sense? When you refuse to acknowledge that you were once lost, how can you help other people to acknowledge their lostness? To the degree that you either forget your inherent depravity and your constant need of grace... To that same degree, you lose your priestness and you fail to be able to relate with other sinners who need hope. What do you mean? When they see that you're not perfect, that you don't walk on water, that you still have struggles, that you still have to pray, that you still need to read, that you still need the grace of God, that you're utterly dependent upon the Holy Ghost, that you're looking to Christ alone for your salvation because you know that's in you, that's in your flesh dwells no good thing. That gives him hope to say, man, if God can save a bag of dirt like you, he can have mercy on me. If he can save a sinner like you, there's hope for me. But you have to embrace that. That's part of your priesthood. you got to be a priest. Remember Gideon, when he was able to destroy the army, remember he had a trumpet, but then he had a vessel with a light inside of it. But what had to happen to that earthen vessel first? It had to be broken. God only shines the light of truth through humble, broken vessels. Humble, broken vessels. Embrace that so God will use you. That's why we want to stay away from that sort of uh, uh, over-realized eschatology, that kind of word of faith movement that, 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 that teaches you you got to act like you always got it together all the time and you don't ever struggle. You don't ever have shortcomings and your faith is perfect all the time. You can't help nobody like that. God saves hellbound sinners, doesn't he? He saves rebel sinners who turn from their sin. And even though we're work in process, our perfection is not to be found in ourselves. It's to be found in our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you. I'll stop there. All right. We'll have uh, our offering and then we'll have our musicians come.